celebrate it. Now, many Christians, especially uh, the Catholics, are the ones who give up something for Lent. And they give up or fast from something so that they can, it's not just for the fact of fasting, but it is because they want to be able to remember and share in Christ's suffering of 40 days when he was fasting and then he was tempted by um, Satan. So to commemorate that, remember that, share in that suffering. And also we fast a lot of people from food, from social media, from TV, you know, for whatever it is, from gaming. People fast because instead of the time that you would use scrolling through social media, gaming, and stuff like that, it's supposed to be then used to um, reduce distractions um, and let go of worldly attachments and instead spend that time in prayer in reflecting and meditating, not just use that time then to do something else and fill it with another worldly uh, hobby or something like that. But it is a time to focus on God. So as we reflect on the significance of this season, as we ascend the hill of the Lord um, during this time, I think it's a really good time for us to also consider how we can help others to be closer to Jesus, how we can help others to encounter the risen Lord, not just for ourselves, drawing nearer, closer, meditating, but how then focusing on how it is that we can help others to do that, bring others to Jesus. In Mark chapter two, we find this really great story. Um, it's a great testimony about faith and friendship. It's a well-known story about these four men who went above and beyond in helping their paralyzed friend in bringing their paralyzed friend to Jesus. So today's message, oh, it's already up there. Um, it's titled, Bring Them to Jesus. We're gonna be looking at Mark chapter two, verses one through 12. And it's from this story that I want us to see how we can intentionally how can we be intentional about bringing people to encounter Jesus? Okay, so think about that. Keep that in mind as we read through the verses. <clears throat> A few days later, when Jesus again entered Calpurnium, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then they lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what these guys, these people were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, he totally calls them out, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Now, this same story is also told in Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. You know how the Gospels have parallel stories, so you can go there. Um, and in Luke's account, it's pretty, very, very similar, pretty much the same, except that in Luke's account, he adds the detail that the people who were crowded inside the house, around the house, and flowing out of the house, that they had come from villages um, of, um, they came from the villages and towns of Galilee, from Judea, and also from Jerusalem. So he was specific in adding the detail that it wasn't just the people within that one town of Calpurnium, but it was people from different places traveling to come there. And that's how famous Jesus had become. 
because in the, in the verse it says that he had returned home, he's back in Calpurnia, people heard wide and near and far, heard about this and people rushed to see him. People were coming to hear him speak and to receive healing because they had heard that there was a man who had the gift of healing. So when these friends heard that there, you know, Jesus was home and he, he had come and Jesus was in town, they went, they got their paralyzed friend and they physically carried him and they brought him to Jesus. So this afternoon, I want to take a closer look at these four friends. I know that this story is very familiar to a lot of us, but let's look a little bit close, uh, closer at this. So these four friends, I love that this story um, is about evangelism. I know when you first look at it, you think about, oh, it's about healing. Or you think, oh, it's about those Pharisees and you know them trying to you know discredit Jesus. But if you really look at it, I love the fact that the story is about evangelism, a story about four men concerned about their friend who is in desperate need of Jesus's healing touch and how they get him to Jesus, right? So basically, a story of friends bringing someone to uh, meet and encounter Jesus. And that's what evangelism is, is it not? For us to bring people to meet and encounter Jesus, to bring people to Jesus. That, folks, is what evangelism is. And it's something that any of us can do. It is something that all of us should be doing. Here are three ways that these friends were able to accomplish this. Three ways I want to see. First, firstly, for them to even do this, they cared. They had to care enough. They hear that Jesus is in town. What do they do? They go and get their friend. They think about their friend who is in desperate need, needs a desperate touch. They go, they care. They felt the urgency. They felt the desperation of having their, this chance, this opportunity to have their friend healed. And they want to seize upon it, right? And so they care enough for their friend to meet Jesus. They believed without a doubt that their friend needed Jesus and that, in fact, Jesus could heal him. They had the faith, right, for that. I don't know if you guys have heard of Bruce Beresford. Bruce Beresford is a veteran film director. He's Australian. I don't know if you've ever heard of any of his works. Some of the movies that he's made, um, I think he's been a director for like 40, 50 years, so he's quite old. He's veteran. He made a movie called Crimes of the Heart. I think it might have been in the 80s. Um, he made a movie called Driving Miss Daisy. Anybody heard that one? Driving Miss Daisy is old, but um, people, it's more popular. And most recently, he was the one who directed and remade the TV series Roots. Roots was a long, long time ago, but they, had, they redid it, a remake of it, Roots. So this Australian director, film director, is the one who did that. Now, during an interview um, with a magazine, he talked about the most difficult film that he has ever made in his career. And it was a 1991 film called Black Robe. Anybody ever heard of this movie called Black Robe? Well, I guess it wasn't very successful. <laughs> but now you know about it. Google it. Look it up. Not right now, but um, it's, it's worth seeing. So Black Robe, he talked about how this was the most difficult film, 1991, that he has ever made. It was about a French Jesuit missionaries working with the indigenous First Nations people in Quebec, in Canada. So it was Jesuit priest, these missionaries, working with the indigenous First Nation um, uh, people. And it was bitterly, bitterly crazy cold during this time of filming. The bitterly cold weather during the filming in Canada was a logistical nightmare. And so was trying to accurately portray the historical facts because it was based on true history. And this is really what happened. There was this Jesuit order of missionaries, right? But he said that his greatest challenge in making this film was, quote, making the priest's missionary obsession believable to film goers today. He said that was his biggest challenge. How am I going to capture on film that just the feeling, the obsession, and, and just the passion of these missionaries of why they're doing what they do and what they go through? Is it believable that 
they're so passionate about this that the sufferings and, and, and the choices and the things that they go through. He said, making the priest's missionary obsession believable to today's film goers. He also said, quote, the main character, the priest, he was obsessed with getting people into heaven. This is a concept few people these days take seriously. My job was to, give, to convince an audience that this is important. So if you don't get that part of the, uh, before you watch the movie or during the movie, then you're just gonna be like, eh, you, you don't get it. The obsession and the importance of why this priest had to get people into heaven, right? This obsession. So let's ask ourselves, is such an obsession believable? For us, we say we are Christians and that we have a purpose and, you know, one glorious obsession that we have, one beautiful, you know, obsession that we have is to worship God, to glorify God, to love God, uh, all these things that many of us are able to say with our mouths and lips. But is such obsession believable? That people will be so obsessed to do anything that they can to get people into heaven. How passionate are we about getting people into heaven? I know we're gonna say, well, we're not missionaries. We didn't take vows and, you know, the, we're not monks, we're not priests, we're not, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Do we need convincing? Do we as Christians need convincing of the importance and how that, to be convinced that this obsession is, is real and that it is possible and that it is believable, that there are people in this world obsessed with trying to get people into heaven and evangelizing. These four friends were convinced that their paralyzed friend needed Jesus, that his only hope for healing, this was his chance to be healed, was in Jesus. And so as we see in this story, they were willing to do almost anything almost anything to bring their friend face to face with this Jesus. So secondly, first was that they cared. Secondly, they acted. They, it moved them to action. They didn't just sit at home praying about it, <laughs> you know, and I'm not knocking prayer, please hear me. You know, I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray, but these friends didn't say, okay, let's have a prayer meeting and let's just pray for his healing. You know, they could have done that too, but it moved them to action. They acted. They didn't sit around about it, but they jumped into action. They acted on their belief, on their faith. They were determined to get their friend to Jesus, believing that if Jesus, if they just got this friend in the presence of Jesus, he could and would be healed. The Bible doesn't tell us where they lived, which town or village um, that these friends were from. So we don't know where they came from. We don't know how far that they might have had to carry this paralyzed friend. It's not like they loaded him into a car, right? And so when you read the story, we don't know. Remember, we said it was people from Samaria, um, it was from Jerusalem and Judea and other places. So we don't know if it was a couple days journey. We don't know if it might have been right next door. We don't know, right? But can you imagine, can you imagine carrying around the dead weight of a fully grown man who's paralyzed, who's lame. That is not easy. That is not easy. Full weight, lame person carrying this person around, right? You have to picture this, imagine it. But when they heard that Jesus was back in Capernaum, they knew that they had to get their friend to him because they believed. They believed that Jesus was the only one who could heal their friend. They didn't let the distance, they didn't let the crowded house, because again, once they get there and they're like, oh, oh my gosh, you know how you, sometimes you get somewhere and it's super, super crowded and you're like, oh, forget it, and you leave, right? Because you don't want to wait in line. You know what I'm talking about, right? So as they got there, they weren't overwhelmed. They're like, oh, there's no way we're going to get our friend in there. I mean, look at this. You know, it wasn't even, that didn't deter them at all as well. And then the difficulty, even when they hatched the plan, maybe they didn't think it all through, but the difficulty of having then to lower this friend down into this room to cut a roof, you know, and to do all that, they were willing to look foolish they were willing to look awkward. They were willing to risk getting in trouble for cutting a hole in someone's house. 
You have to think about this. We just read this and we're like, oh, what a beautiful story. Oh, their faith was amazing. But you have to think, if you put, your play, if put yourself in their shoes, you know, you don't just go in and cut a hole in someone's house. How would you feel if someone cut a hole in the, side of your, in the siding of your house or up on the roof, right? So these guys, you ha they had to take the risk. They had to think about it right? Hatch this plan. They were willing to look foolish, willing to get in trouble, willing to uh, maybe get yelled at. What if Jesus was not in a receiving mood and he was like, what are you guys doing? Or if people tried to stop them and yelled at them or, or whatever it might be, right? But none of this deterred them. They went above and beyond in trying to get their friend. They had this one, one purpose and one um, goal, and that was to get their friend to Jesus. Now, the question for us is, are we willing to do whatever it takes to bring people to Jesus? Are we willing to take such risks? Are we willing to have those maybe difficult conversations with our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers? The risk of looking foolish, the risk of being rejected, the risk of being labeled a Jesus freak, you know, uh, in your office, the risk of, you know, all these different risks that are involved in even just having a conversation about faith with the people around us. I read this quote somewhere, and I wanted to share it with you. It said, we may feel like we don't have the right words to share, but if we know enough of the gospel to be saved by it, then we know enough to share it. Does that make sense? We may feel like we don't have the right words to share, but if we know enough of the gospel to be saved by it, then you're good. Then we know enough to share it. If you know enough of the gospel to be saved by it, then you know enough to be sharing it, right? I love that quote. Thirdly, so they cared, they were in, you know, active, they moved into action. Thirdly, they were creative. Come on now, you gotta give them this. They were creative. They were thinking outside the box when they came up with this plan to cut through the roof. The house where Jesus was teaching was standing room only. It said that even, uh, even outside the house, there were like several rows deep of people surrounding the house and such, right? And so verse two says, they were gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. So literally people were like overflowing out the door. They didn't let that stop them, they got creative. Verse four said, since they could not get their friend to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and they lowered the mat the man was lying on. A word about the roof. Digging a hole in the roof of this house did not cause irreparable damage. Okay, so you have to kind of know about, you know, whether it's architecture or the material used uh, during the first century. First century homes in Israel, they had flat roofs. It wasn't, a, you know, like this or anything like that. It was flat roofs and it was composed of clay and stone tiles that were relatively actually easy to remove and replace. Okay, and in the Luke version, I told you it has more details there. In the Luke version of this story, it says that the paralytic was lowered through the tiles of the roof. Right? It actually says that tiles were removed and there were tiles. Now, these tiles were sometimes covered with soil and earth and dirt uh, for insulation purposes. Right? So you have to picture this flat uh, roof up there. And it was also typical uh, for the homes in that day to have an outside staircase. People would gather, so they didn't need a ladder or some sort of pulley system. Most of the homes had an outside kind of a staircase where um, it was relatively easy for them to carry this friend up the stairway because people would um, um, be up there and talk and, I guess, chat and stuff like that up on the roof. So it was relatively easy. So picture all that. Now, for you visual learners out there, I got gotcha. you. So I have these photos. I'll click. Okay, if you can see, I've got six photos for you, six images showing you how, how it might have been done. Here's one. Do you see that? So this is one way. Here's another photo that I found of how they might have possibly lowered him. Do you see the four corners and the rope and how um, this man is being lowered? Here's another uh, artist's rendition of what it could have looked like. 
as they lowered him. Here's another one. Do you see, again, the rope and the guys up on the roof that lowered him? And then here is another one. Again, you see the guys up on the, you, don't, you never see their faces. You don't know what these friends look like, right? Um, you just see his, their hands and their arms as they're doing that and lowering it. And then the last one, this one. Oh, you see, you see a face there. Well, not really clearly, but you can see the th two, uh, four friends up there lowering their paralyzed friend down to Jesus. Now, Verse 5 says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus saw the faith of the four friends as they lowered the mat. In all six of these pictures, it looks like a rope is tied, as I pointed out, it looks like all six of them, a rope is tied to the four corners of this mat. And it shows each friend, each of the four friends, holding one of the ropes, right? It wasn't a pulley system or anything like that. You, will, you see that, right? So we know that our faith cannot save someone else. We can't believe for someone. Even for my kids, you know, if I want my kids to be saved and, and to uh, know Jesus and to be a believer, I can't believe for them. We cannot, um, we're not able to save someone else through our faith, right? Because they must believe. Each person must individually accept Jesus Christ and believe the good news. But we can certainly have a big helping hand in helping our friends and our VIPs to come to Christ. That is our role. We certainly can have a big hand in helping and ushering people into the kingdom, in helping bringing them to Jesus Christ. So the question I want to ask all of us, are you actively engaged right now in carrying a corner of a mat that a paralyzed friend is lying on? Are you actively engaged currently right now? Do you have a hand on a corner of a mat of a friend, a paralyzed friend is lying on? Think about people you know who don't know Jesus, who are not saved, very important people in your life. Think about them. And are you one of the four holding a corner of the mat? waiting, lowering them into Jesus' presence. Now let's look at the paralyzed man himself. We know nothing about this man. We don't know anything about this man, really, right? Except for the fact that he was paralyzed, and he had four very determined friends. He had four really good, loyal friends. I want friends like this. I have friends like this. I really hope you all have friends like this who will run through fire and you know risk everything, destroying property and everything for you, to get you healing, to help you, to save you. I, w I hope all of us have friends like this. But we don't know much about the paralyzed man except for the fact that he's got these awesome friends, right? And sometimes in the Bible, we are given a bit more information about those who are infirm or sick or diseased or, or something like that, right? Because sometimes the Bible will describe a person by saying, oh, this person so-and-so was paralyzed from birth. Or we will read a description that says he was born blind. Right? So then we know that it was a congenital uh, condition or that you know, it wasn't an accident or something like that, but that they, they were born blind or, or et cetera. But here we don't know that. We don't know how this man became you know, uh, paralyzed. Was it from birth? You know, uh, was it an accident? Or when did it happen? We just don't know. Do you think, honest question, do you think that this man would have been disappointed when, do you think he was disappointed when Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven? Instead of, you're healed. Do you think this man was disappointed? They go, and his friends too. They go through all this trouble. They go through lots of trouble, lower him. And instead of saying, you know, immediately get up, you're healed. But says, your sins are forgiven. Do you think he was disappointed? He and his friends were probably expecting, as I would have been, a some sort of declaration of a physical healing, right? Because that's probably what they were thinking is, get our friend, paralyzed friend to Jesus, and the healing will come. 
In the culture of that day, physical abnormalities, disease, illness, lameness, deafness, blindness, such things, sickness, especially from birth, were thought to be a judgment from God for serious sins. Like, what did this person do wrong, and why are they being cursed this way? That was just kind of the norm that um, how people believed. Remember, even in um, John chapter 9, the disciples believed this too. In John chapter 9, when they were confronted with a man blind from birth, um, the disciples asked, they said, why was this man born blind? They said, was it because of his own sins or the sins of his parents? So the disciples are even saying this. Well, I believe that when Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus was dealing with the man's greatest need. Not a physical healing, but an inner healing. He was probably carrying around a lot of heavy guilt for many years regarding his paralysis, rightly or wrongly, right? But again, given the belief of that day, right? He probably thinks, oh, what did I do? I did something wrong. Why am I paralyzed like this? And he just has, you know, whether he's beaten himself up about it or, you know, anyone who's infirm and stuff like that, usually, I think there's something that no, no one's talking about here. And the fact is, you don't usually befriend lame people, paralyzed people, diseased people. That in itself is a risk because you don't want to be associated with a sinner, someone who's so sinful that God, you know, smited him and, and caused him to be, you know, lame or handicapped or something like that. So you're not going to be buddy-buddy with people who are handicapped and sick and, and things like that. So, you know, you have to think about that for a moment too. These friends, amazing friends that they are. But so here... It's not a physical he healing, but an inner healing that I believe. That this man probably also needs, is in great need of physical healing, yes, to make his life better, but there is more. There is inner healing that needs to happen because probably the guilt, the shame, the, the doubt, and the pain that he's carrying around. So Jesus, he needed Jesus to release him from this, this inner pain, giving him not only a new body, but a new heart and mind, to refresh, renew his heart and his mind. But we know that this man also did receive the physical healing because we know in verses 11 and 12, Jesus does tell him, I tell you, get up, take your mat, go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of everyone. This amazed them all, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. We have never seen anything like this before. So people start to rejoice and praise God when they see this healing. The paralytic received his physical healing, but we cannot forget that the greatest need that people have is a spiritual healing. It's spiritual in nature, and that is the need for salvation. As the praise team comes up here, I want to close and say, we cannot forget that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't come to just heal people. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to give his life as a ransom for many, not to just be a healer. Jesus met people's physical needs so that their hearts would be open to receiving him and the gospel. Oftentimes, when he performed miracles and healings like that, it was not just, oh, thanks for the healing, and people would go away, but it was then that their hearts were opened and, and, you know, receiving from the love of God. Because again, these people who have physical deformities and ailments and such are usually shunned by society and shunned by the population. And so a lot of them have so much emotional and, and, and you know, inner healing that is needed even more so than the physical one for being shunned and being an outcast for their physical ailments. Jesus met people's physical needs. Can we follow the example of this paralytic's four friends? Can we care? Can we act? Can we be creative about bringing people to Jesus? We may be surprised at how many of our paralyzed friends, neighbors, and coworkers are willing to be carried to Jesus. They just don't have anyone to carry them. They may be willing, they may be wanting, they may be waiting, 
They may be looking for someone to help them get to Jesus. We are not doing our part. We've got to roll up our sleeves and grab that rope. And we've got to lower people or raise people, drag people. We've got to do what we can to bring people to Jesus. I'm getting all emotional here. We began house church. And that was my heart when we began house church for the unsaved. I have done life with you people now at Hope Church for 15 years. I've been here for 15 years. And I hope I've been adequate or, or a good pastor, caring for you, shepherding you. But my desire is to see you all, for you all to be empowered and released to bring your friends and family and neighbors and coworkers and, and people into the kingdom, for you to be obsessed with it. You have to believe that it is a glorious obsession. It's got to be believable. If we're not believing it, how are non-Christians going to believe it? We've got to be willing to really take up our piece of that mat and do our part in bringing people to Christ. Can we follow the example of these four friends? Can we be creative about how we bring people to Jesus? And as I said, I think we will be surprised at how many people among us are hurting and wanting, but we are not lifting that rope. If we would only be obsessed like the Jesuit priest in the movie Black Robe, that is my desire for us to be as obsessed and that it is believable. Let's pray. Lord, we just cry out to you, God, that you have got to transform our hearts, Lord. We sit here week after week, worshiping you, cozy in just the knowledge and the, and the confidence of salvation, of being saved. God, knowing where we're going, knowing uh, that we have eternal salvation, God, and being thankful. Yes, being grateful people. But Father, as we sit here, Lord, week after week or day after day, Father, would you grant us this obsession, this passion, Lord, for bringing others to you. God, would you stir in us, God, this, this unrest, Lord, would you stir in us such a desire and a passion, God, to be able to bring our coworkers, our friends and our neighbors, and even just the person on the street, God, to be bold, to reach out, to say, can I pray for you? and to be able to share and open difficult conversations about faith with these ones, God. Father, so many are waiting. You did say that the harvest is plentiful, and I believe, God, that the harvest is here. Lord, it is here. Father, would you move us to be able to go forth, God, and to be the workers that will harvest the field, that the harvest is ripe, Lord, and so, Father, that you would move us into action, into caring for and being creative in how we, to, we are to do this, God. So, Father, would you speak to each one of us today, even as we leave this room today and walk out, Father, we pray, Lord, that you would place upon our hearts this passion. And we thank you, God, that you desire to use us that you call us friend, and that we are on this mission with you, God, that we are co-workers, co-laborers, God, in this. So we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.
like we love no one else. Your greatness soon will be uncovered. And all the earth will then know. And all the earth will then know. This goals will be exposed as idols that we've made. For you alone will be exalted in that day. And you'll be seen as rightful king. And from my hearts will say oh, make it a prayer. Just put me anywhere. Just put your glory in me. And I'll serve anywhere. Just let me see your beauty. So put me anywhere. Just put your glory in me. And I'll serve anywhere. Just let me see your beauty. Would you put us anywhere? We want to see your glory. We are willing to serve anywhere that you would let us see your glory. May that be truly our heart's desire. Let us see your glory. 
We're willing to serve anywhere that you put us, God. May we go forth this week and every day being intentional about what we say and what we do for your glory. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the amazing love of God the Father, the communion and fellowship of our Holy Spirit be with all of us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.